What's up, world? It's your boy, the Bearded Brother. What's up, world? It's your boy, the Bearded Brother, and I'm back with a special episode of the Bearded Tastings. These guys hit me up in my DMs, wanting to jump on the show, and of course, I'm not going to say no, but without further ado, I brought my guy, Brandon, of Drought Season um, to talk about Beer's Black History and their story and things like that, but enough about me, but Brandon, um, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having us, bro. Appreciate it. Of course, of course. Um, We've talked before um, when I was on the Swig podcast, and yep. we've kind of just stayed in touch. And you guys, it's February, so you know what that means. It's Black History Month. So we got to talk about his- all the Black history, all of it, especially beer, because beer is Black history that people don't really realize. And I just kind of want my – a man to t- kind of just talk about like how is beer black history well you know like most cool things in this world it came from us true <laughs> you know, true the true the day. Um, there are a lot of different you know stories that are floated out there but when you really dig into your research man um, you know the first known recipe uh, for beer or what ended up evolving into the beer that we drink you know every day some of us uh, came from uh, black women in Mesopotamia around 3,900. Um, so, you know, there's, a, you know, you have the Zulu the goddess of beer. Like we, we have, they're all kind of different like deities and things throughout African tradition and culture, even breaking it down to the, the first known breweries or what evolved in the breweries of the brewing system came from ancient Egypt. Like most things with math and science came from ancient Egypt and just ended up getting, you know, stolen and, and flipped throughout different cultures. So, of course, you know, at the end of the day, like what we drink, what's available around the world, you know, it didn't first come from monks. It didn't first come from Germany or Austria, nothing like that. It, it came right there in, in the crest where most of uh, civilization came from. Right from the motherland, as people will say. Exactly. And exactly. so... Uh, Kind of just talking about going into the history. I want to go to the history of drought season. How did that come up, and why did you feel like there was a need for drought season to be something happening in Atlanta? So, so we have a crew um, here in Atlanta called Brutang, and we had talked forever about, like, yo, we should do this, we should do that, and you know how it is, man. People of course. People lives, they got kids, all of that stuff, so, like, me – and Kevin, uh, who will be joining us in a second, my business partner, we were just sitting at a bar one day and we were like, man, we should really like do something like for real. Let's not just talk about it. Let's not do the just the planning stages. Let's really execute. And, you know, both of us are you know, wearing the sneakers. We're both low heads, all of that stuff. And we were like, you know, it's we drink craft beer, but there's and and we're there's a proliferation of black folks and hip hop or whatever within the craft beer scene, but nothing is really represented as a lifestyle. When you you know people who partake legally in uh, marijuana, you know if I see somebody in a cookies t-shirt, I know what it is. You know what I mean? If I see somebody right. in in a Ford jacket, a NASCAR jacket, nine times out of ten, you get back to their crib, it's gonna be a Ford or an American car there. There is none of that for craft beer. So instead of going to breweries or asking people why it didn't exist, we decided to do it ourselves. So drought season is the brand because, you know, obviously draft is pronounced a different way, you know, in other countries. Yes. So it's a play on words and that. And we're also hip hop. So, you know, I'm, I'm 45 years old. So I, I, I was raised in Oakland, California, in the Bay Area during a, a different era. So if there was a drought back then in the street, it mean that, you know, they, they didn't have that product that they needed to make money. And I feel like in this business, even though we created it, there's a drought on us in the business. We make up less than 1% of brewery owners. So it's drought season. Yes, that's what it yes. is. And that's why we're pushing the line on this. And we don't want it to be drought season. But until we get to the point where we're really represented on a large scale, then that's what it is. I gotcha. I gotcha. And just kind of just... um. Talk about ownership 
like where do you feel like the gap is of in craft beer talking about like black people and bringing into the community where do you think that gap happened where it's like oh that's white people shit now rather than oh we made this back in our own land let's own it I, a, I believe that a lot of our stories are under told or not told at all. So I don't think that there's necessarily a pride in it. Uh, B, I believe that, you know, again, I'm 45 years old. I was around and of age when, you know, my liquor was super popping and, and St. Ides and OE and Mickey's and all of that stuff. You know, even before that, King Cobra, Billy D, all of that in the 70s. Right. Those were the things that were pushed to our community and they were, it wasn't sustainable. When people figured out that it was bad for you, it was the scraps, it wasn't quality beer, then it wasn't cool anymore. Now you see somebody with a 40 in their hand, you look at them crazy. Whereas in the 90s, you saw somebody with a 40 in their hand, that might have been the cool guy in the neighborhood because everybody did it. So I think that's a major part of it. But if you really look at like the ebb and flow of the, the beer and spirits and stuff that we partake in, like there was a time when vodka wasn't cool. Now, Ciroc is cool. You know what I mean? Right. Now we're really getting to a point like Hennessy used to be the drink. Now, you know, it's still there, but now like the if it's the same type of crowd back in the day at the club that would have got some Hennessy, now they'll get tequila because tequila is cool because marketing has made it cool. Diageo does an excellent job of branding mm-hmm. their liquors. And it's yep. only, I mean, I not to disparage any company, but dude, Patron is horrible tequila. But Patron it's, it's not good at all. Popping. Yeah, Patron was super popping once upon a time. Then it went to 1800, which is cool. But <laughs> right, eighteen hundred is, is is better than you know is better than Patron. Now we're on Casamigos. Like I'm a tequila guy, but like what I drink is not really popular at all, and it doesn't cost you know some of it doesn't cost much more than Casamigos costs. But it's 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 all marketing. But to I kind of went on a diatribe there. But to answer your question, like really it, it comes down to what's cool. And we make everything cool in this country and by extension, the rest of the world. So in order for craft beer to be legitimately cool, we're going to have to be in the mix. No, I definitely agree with that. Being able to have our voices heard and not even heard, represented properly because you do have in craft beer, a lot of hip hop affiliation and shout outs and tributes but when you go to the breweries page and see their about me section not a singular black person in there not even that works front of house and if they do work there they probably work back house in the kitchen you don't talk about them as much it's no one on the forefront there's no one in ownership or in any level of power and so it's like it's hard to see that representation and um I, was and I don't I, I think it's like any other not any other i think it's a lot of other um industries in this country where they're co-opting hip-hop they're not really a part of the culture like there's a ton of you know we we see these cans and they may have like a font or you know art from a different um you know from a different group or you know some label or whatever and then mm-hmm. you really dig into it you have a conversation with somebody in the group or somebody affiliated with the group They have nothing to do with it, but they do it to us because it's easier. I guarantee you if they had a Kiss or a Metallica can and didn't have that clear, there will be a cease and desist and them cans will be pulled off the shelf immediately. Yeah, it wouldn't even make it off the cannon line Like as soon as they catch wind of it. And it's only a certain level of like black service that can pull that off. Like there was a brewery that made the beer, beer Yonce. And that got shut down real quick. But, like, yeah. you'll see, I'll see, I've seen Biggie tributed. I've seen Tupac. I've seen a bunch of other artists that are just sitting there. And and I, I think that's part of it, too. Like, if the estates aren't together, then, you know, there's, there's always been some kind of conflict with the Tupac estate. I'm not sure what Biggie's estate is like, but I... You know, it's it's easier to take advantage if somebody is no longer here. Right. And no, that's very true. I didn't really uh think about that. But um 
with like drought season, um, I think that's very impactful on what you guys are doing. You guys are bringing our culture and giving like crap here that shot in the arm that we needed back in 2020. Um, I think you guys were doing it back then. And do you kind of see the craft beer scene change in the last little last two years or so from when we've talked last on the swig to now, or is it still kind of the same? Uh, I think on the, on the surface things have changed. I think when you dig deep, not a whole, whole lot has changed. I know that there are a lot of people that are, are coming out and, and, and calling out racism and sexism, um, in the business, which is great. Um, right. but you know, things need to be done because everybody can't, you know, if there's a, a, a racist brewery and somebody works there, everybody can't up and quit. Like they need, you know, they need that paper, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, right. it's, it's I guess it extends in the cancel culture. It's like, all right, cool. We're not rocking with this particular brand. What's next? Are we taking that money and putting it into a black owned brewery? Are we taking that money and putting it into a woman owned brewery? Like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? Right. It's not enough just to be like, oh, we not rocking with this one. Like, and then go ahead and spend your money with somebody else that's just as racist and just as sexist. Like, and they just, just and they just it. haven't shown it yet. So there's exactly, just exactly. they haven't exposed themselves. And so, but, but, but you know, I I do see you know here in Atlanta we have since we last spoke you know Hip and Hops is open first black owned brick and mortar in Atlanta. Um, Shout out to Nappy Roots. They just did the grand yes. opening of Atlantucky. We actually had, I don't know when this is coming out, but we have an event on Friday in Atlantucky, dropping a brew with those brothers and dropping a capsule collection, Beer's Black History Capsule Collection. Um, you have, you know, I think the a lot of the black brewers are either working to open tap rooms or working to open brick and mortar breweries which is great. But as far as I know, we still only have 14 black owned brick and mortar breweries in America, 14. There are some cities that have got more than 14 breweries on the side of town. You know what I mean? Right. Like, right. That's know, Nashville. We, like, we got a long, we got a long way to go. Oh yeah, for sure. And I want to talk about like those actions. Like what does that look like to you and how can we ensure those actions are being taken as a craft beer, budding craft beer influencer or someone that's a lifestyle influencer, how we make sure we hold breweries accountable and they're moving forward with us and showing us our favorite question. When a person apologizes, we always like to say, and like, how do we make sure people are doing those ands? So that's, 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 that's a, it's a multi-layered answer to that question. Uh, hit me. But before you hit me first, let me crack this beer open. We're on a beer podcast and I haven't yes, I haven't taken a sip yeah, yet. Shout, Not- out, shout out to the homies, man. Black Calder, as y'all see. Black Calder, In- what's up, Pop? You yes. definitely want to pick up this Pullman Porter. I don't like porters. Neither does Ken. What? Oh, oh, that's... And I'm not just saying it because our name is on it. This Porter is fire. Make sure y'all okay. pick it up at Broadleaf. Yeah, hey, bro- anybody near at Broadleaf that listens to my podcast, holler at your boy, DM me. We'll work Ooh. something out. I'll send you my address, send you the coins yeah, to get yeah. to sit down here. Like, I need that on my doorstep. So, again... My folks in, you, you in Michigan, like it, bro. I'm telling you, I do. I love porters. porters. I love so porters. I That's my number two know. right there. Okay, so I'm, I'm a stout guy. I feel like porters. Are typical That's my number guys. one, though. <laughs> I get so, no. I get that. That's you. Not wrong. I get that. Stouts are my number one, but I like a porter every now and then because sometimes porters can give you at times. Look, it could be. A little more refreshing sometimes. Sometimes I like my styles to hit. So, yeah. and not all the time I don't want to style because I was like, so yeah, I like I like my porters because every now and then I'm like I kind of want something drinkable. I don't need anything to hit me immediately because yeah. I had a decent day. I don't need to. <laughs> nah, you you'll like it, man. You'll like it. But to to answer your question, um, we have to support each other, man. Like a lot of you know people keep talking about this. Uh, black people spending power in this country. Uh, yes. I believe like the last time I saw it was like 1.6 trillion. 
uh, something like that. Yeah. Year, and they put it out there as if we get money and we just spend it on luxury goods and vacations and Cadillacs. That's not the case. We spend the same percentages of on living, on transportation, on food, on necessities. The thing is, we don't own none of that. So that's how right. money goes out of our community. So if we are building housing co- complexes, if we are building apartments, if we are building supermarkets, that's when the money stays in our community. It ain't like we just tricking off the bread. We're not spending it with each, with each other because across the board, we don't own those things. Right. So it goes back to this. However much money we spend on, spend on beer a year, if you're in Atlanta, okay, cool. You you love Monday night. They're an ally. Monday night rock with us. Shout out to Peter. You love Sweetwater. You love whatever. That's cool. But take some of that bread and go to Hip and Ops. Take some of that bread and go to Atlantucky. So take some of that bread when you go to the grocery store, buy down home, buy Conzo. Yes. You know what I mean? That's Shout out Conzo. That's, that's, that's how we change it. That's how the paper stays in our community. That's how our dollar is respected. And that's how we ended up. That's how we end up building instead of constantly spending with other people and not getting gaining any ground. We'll we'll always be at that, you know, less than one percent if we don't do that, if we don't create infrastructure and support each other. Oh, yeah, for sure. And speaking of structure, and infrastructure, the structure in this conversation just got a little bit stronger because my guy Swerve just stepped into the studio. Um, it's Swerve. Can't call him by his government. He got on me last time. So I, I remember I got that written down right over here. Like, call him Swerve. Got it. Swerve got it. Um, so that's for, for everybody. I didn't mean to make that rhyme, but it just worked out. Um, <laughs> what's going on, Swerve? Yep. We got potholes in Nashville, so I understand. Good, good, good. Okay, yeah, we were just kind of just talking about, like, it's good. It's good. But, yeah, we are just kind of just been talking about um, how we can have those. Uh, Brandon just brought up um, talking about how we can move beyond 1% ownership in the craft beer world. And he mentioned something really interesting. It's just we have all this spending power, but we don't have the ownership and we don't have people coming on when there is that little sliver of ownership. We don't put as much emphasis as we would on someone else. And I just kind of want to ask you the same question as um, how do we move black people forward in craft beer and when it comes to ownership, knowledge and understanding? Uh-oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I do definitely love those ideas and because I, I work off that same mindset of being able to support, like you said, the hip and hops, the consoles and the down homes, but also making sure allies are doing the same thing. If you're an ally, make sure you're doing a collab and really putting them more on the forefront than you. 
because Monday night is going to do Monday night numbers. Whatever beer they put out, they're going to hit their numbers no matter what they do with it. People see it on their social media. People are going to all make the inside. They don't have to say, hey, look at us. There's like, hey, we just dropped this super dope Imperial Brown Ale. Come get it. And people are going to come get it. They're like, oh, I've never had this before. And it's Monday night, so I know it's going to be fire. But you do something with concept like, hey, we paired with console. We're doing this with them to support them and really put them on the forefront and give them that same energy. I think goes along with what you guys are saying is people like us taking our money to console as well as Monday night, but also Monday night being like, hey, take your money over there as well. Because we as drop season, as the bearded brother, as the black beer experience here in Nashville or uh, Ale Sharpton, we can only talk and yell and scream so much, but um, our voices can carry a lot longer and farther when we have these breweries been like, hey, check out what the Beater Brothers doing. We worked with him. This is what we did. And go support them. If you want to buy the beer, you can buy the beer, but like, make sure you get in front of those guys. And, um, and I think you guys are doing that with the beer is black history. So you guys are coming in with the education and the lifestyle and showing that beer. Beer is dope. And whether you know that or not, if you talk to Brandon or Swerve or me about it, you're going to start realizing that. But um, with the, this uh, collaborations you guys are doing with different breweries, can you guys talk about that a little bit more? What was the idea behind it and what's the intended impact uh, with that? And have you seen any kind of results from these collaborations so far? I mean, essentially, what Swerve was just saying, like, collaboration is key in order to really push the line and spread the message on what we're trying to do. So in order to work with a Black Calder in Michigan, to work with Atlantucky in Georgia, to work with Hella Coastal in Oakland, California, like, it, even though, you know, there's a, a pocket that knew, you know, in Michigan that knew about Hella Coastal, that knew about Atlantucky, all of that, but now because – we take a different approach where we're not a brewery. So we're not in competition with any breweries. We can push everybody and that's what we're doing. So, you know, we've been on caches, which is TV one's platform pumping up all the breweries. We were just in butter ATL today. And there's a couple of few other big media looks coming up over the next couple of weeks that are going to shine light on all of these breweries that we're working with. And that's really the purpose. Like we're not here to take money out of nobody pocket food off nobody table. We want everybody to eat and we want to eat too. And the best way to do that is by coming together in collaboration. Like you, you definitely accomplish way more collaborating than you do competing. Oh yeah. That, say that, say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that's yeah, right. cooperative economics, exactly. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I'm looking on you guys' website, and you guys say, "Sorry, say that again." I think he froze up. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I love that. And another thing I love about you guys is um, looking on your website, you guys call your collection capsule. Is that just like something you just so happen to use that word? Or is there like kind of like um, an attention behind that word? Because that like you don't use capsule like that without like hearing it in medicine or anything like that. It's just a streetwear 
fashion term for when you you, you drop a, a limited amount of of a collection ah, okay. or whatnot. So yeah, that's just that's it. Not, nothing super deep behind it. Okay, yeah, I I didn't know. So yeah. boy, you know, people, he, we're here to learn. For we're sure. here to get educated and educate sure. people. So, um, I definitely wanted to um, continue to talk about um, collaborations and um, you guys as well. It's just. Working in this space and talk about collaboration, um, I totally just have my question. I just forgot, just like that. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> like, all good, man. It's all good. But um, yeah, I definitely think I love the collaboration over competition. Um, and it's it's super simple. And But you still get people asking you, like, what can I do? And where do I start? That's probably the number one thing. I guess I was like you could Google, but since you want to ask me, I'm going to tell you this. Like when people approach you guys is like, how do I start the steps in craft beer beyond collaboration and things like that? What can white beer drinkers and white beer owners and employees do to kind of push our agenda forward to create the community that is so prided in craft beer. Like everybody cr- pr- prides themselves. Oh, we create a great community that everybody can love and enjoy. But it's like, mm, what community? White men with the man buns and the beards? <laughs> or the bearded brother who's bald and Brandon and swear we feel comfortable walking in there. Like, how do they get stuck? Somebody asked you that. How do they get started in creating that community? Use your financial capital. Use your cultural capital to, to push forward people that don't look like you. It's pretty simple. You would think. <laughs> I mean, it's, would... it's simple. Like, if, if you want to do it, then it's simple. Like, people like to overcomplicate things uh, at times, but that's really what it boils down to. Like you mentioned earlier, we have social media. Use your social media to push out black brewers, to push out, you know, black companies within this space. Use it to push out women companies, women within the space genuinely, not to to look cool and not during Black History Month, but all the time. Uh, and, and use your financial capital, man. Beard, the margins on beer are not, uh, are great. Like there is bread to be spent on things. Oh, yeah. You spend that bread you know, with companies that are not your own company or, you know, their incubator programs, there are scholarships, there are a bunch of different things you can do to, to put on people that are interested in this business and interested in learning in this business as well as those who are established. Yeah, definitely. Um, before I kind of wrap up with things, I wanted to get, talk to you guys about Barrel and Flow and you guys ability to come up there and if y'all are going to be in the tennis this year um this august we've been definitely talking about it i think it's it's pretty much a a, a foregone conclusion that we, that we will be there okay Oh yeah, for sure, for sure, and yeah, I swear I can't. You were talking about off camera. I can't have you uh, getting cussed out for not pulling up somewhere you're supposed to be at. No, I got you. So I I might get cussed out like you uh 
you were you were uh, swerved this year because I'm I'm a game time decision. Um, it's August. And I get married like the first weekend, Labor Day weekend, and it's September. So I was like, whew. And I got five other weddings out t- outside of mine. I got to attend or be in this year. So uh, hopefully, some something works out. Um, I am a free agent when it comes to collaboration. So I'm just. I'm just putting it out there. I ain't trying to make it obvious, but if it ain't obvious, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) So. Yes. Oh yeah, I will. I collabed. I went last year, and I had a collaboration with a local brewery here in Nashville, Bearded Iris, um, called yeah. the Rollout Stout. We know, we know Bearded Iris. Oh yeah, I did. Uh, I did a, a Rollout Stout with them. I still got a little bit left from the festival. I ended up casing so. Why do you say that. You asked me what spots I went to. That was definitely one of the spots I hit. In Nashville, for sure. <laughs> you are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's our collab cam. It's a um, it's an imperial stout. Um, with we actually threw Slim and Husky cinnamon rolls in the mash. It's with cinnamon, lactose, uh, caramel, pecans, and when it was conditioning, we put a year old age. Stout in the conditioning, so it's not barrel age, but it has just an essence of whiskey barrel age in there. And so, as it kind of opens up and warms up a little bit, you get I like to think of it as different layers. First, you get like the sweetness, you get you taste the cinnamon roll, but like it warms up, you get the cinnamon, the pecans start to flow through, the lactose starts to come in, and you start to taste the whiskey barrel in there as well of the beer that was mixed in with it. And so, and what I love about this, it's other than Bearded Iris, everything's black on there. The artist was my sister who did the can art, uh, the work of Rosa. So if y'all need can art, the work of Rosa on Instagram, make sure you check her, okay. check her out. Um, and we're, we donated the proceeds to a, um, organization called super money kids which helps uh black children understand and build a relationship with money and finances and how to build wealth and understand that and then um of course slim huskies had it at least just in their nashville stores the cans and everything like that so they did a little bit of additional distribution beyond the festival and beyond the tap room so it was like a super collaborative effort which we kind of alluded to earlier it's just like it's a simple thing it's just get into the community talk to people yes Yep. Yep. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes.
<laughs> I feel like I might know, but I ain't no snitch either, so. Yep. No, that's not Atlanta. It happens in Nashville. Um, I've been hitting the DMs. The country. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. You, you ain't wrong about that. I've been hitting the DMs about calling people out by the breweries. And it wasn't just to have like, hey, I'm here to listen and understand. It's here to like, it's, they basically say it was on site. I was like, hey, I'm with it. I'm from zone six. So what you trying to do? What's up? <laughs> like, exactly. like, I ain't the person to just roll up on sometimes like that. If you want to have the conversation, we can have the conversation, but they didn't want to have a conversation, but that's neither here nor there. I ain't trying to give them more of a platform that they don't need. Um, but as we wrap up, like how can they keep up with you guys? How can they keep up with drought season and what you guys are doing and what you guys are going to do next? All right. Well, if you are in Atlanta, Georgia, if you are in the surrounding states, pull up to Atlanta, Kentucky on uh, February 18th, 6 to 9 p.m. We will be having our uh, our launch of our beer that we're doing with Atlanta, Kentucky. It's a, a blackberry wheat ale. Super good. Uh, we'll also have merch there. If you are in California, February 25th, Federation Brewery. Um, downtown, well, really, Jack London Square, Oakland, California. We did a hyped out ale with uh, with um, Hella Coastal. Oh, Mario, Mario make sure you send me some of that stuff, man. Mario, don't, don't play with me, dog. <laughs> um, so we did that February 25th. Pull up, um, go to our Instagram, Drought Season on Instagram. That's D-R-A-U-G-H-T Season on Instagram on all your social media. And make sure you buy product. DroughtSeason.com. Yes. Most important thing, buy the product. We got some for the ladies. We got brewing aprons, the whole nine, the Beards Black History Collection. We got special stuff coming throughout the year. So make sure you go there and buy product. Once again, that is DroughtSeason.com. And if you live in the Bay, you can go ahead and pre-order the IPA. Um, They dropped the pre-order today on Federation's Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we we in it, man. That's that's, that's what it's about, man. Make sure you follow us. Talk to us. Yes. Oh, yeah, most definitely. And, of course, you guys can follow me at The Bearded Brother on all social medias. Check out my website, www.thebeardedbrother.com. And, as always, when you're listening to this podcast, make sure you grab your your people, grab some good-ass beer, and, of course, drink up.